Bonjour tout le monde, bienvenue. Welcome to the Alliance Française Online for this wonderful event, the first of 2021, um, which is an exciting year since yesterday, as every um, one of you probably think. Uh, I want to, before I introduce our uh, distinguished speakers, uh, I would like to take this moment, this opportunity to recognize a couple of you who are here today, inc including a uh, former librarian Brigitte Pichot of Alliance Française and uh, uh, the teachers of Basima, as well as Marie Yasmine, who are here uh, from Alliance Française, and of course also my dear friend Françoise Pfaff from Howard University, whom I can see there, and I'm so glad to, to see you. So um, I, uh, I hope you will enjoy this, this wonderful event, and I will, um, without further ado, introduce the speakers. So this uh, Dr. Tristan Cabello is a historian of American cultures and politics. His research examines social movements with a focus on the intersection of race, sexuality, and politics. He's currently completing a book on Black Lives Matter and teaches history and critical theory at Johns Hopkins University. For those of you who are familiar with Alliance Française, you may have heard Tristan already quite a few times as he's already uh, been um, at Alliance Française in person. Uh, before COVID to, uh, um, to talk about many subjects and including a fabulous interview with Edouard Louis uh, um, in the fall of 2019, uh, or spring rather of 2019. Uh, Dr. Pap Ndiaye is a historian of US history, specialized in African American history. He also works on the history of sociology of Afro descendants in France. He holds an MA from the University of Virginia and a PhD from the uh, Inter École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales AS in Paris. Dr. Ndiaye has been a visiting professor at New York University and Northwestern University. He is currently working at the Paris Institute of Political Studies, what we call Sciences Po Paris, on a history of global civil rights in the 20th century. And um, I will now give the floor to Tristan. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to see uh, Sarah, Natasha, and all the members of the Alliance Française. Um, and so I guess what I'm going to do first is just to talk about uh, and share a brief history of the Black Lives Matter movement in the US and talk about a few differences and a few similarities that I see uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement um, in, uh, in, in France. So. Uh, uh, it's always difficult to talk about Black Lives Matter as a uh, movement uh, because it's not an organized movement uh, to start with. Uh, it's actually a very much a decentralized, a localized movement with different chapters uh, throughout the US. Um, and the movement started actually as a, as a, as a hashtag uh, right after uh, George Zimmerman in uh, 2012, the murder of uh, Trevon Martin. Uh, was acquitted. Uh, and so it started as a hashtag um, on, on Twitter and gained popularity with uh, of following the death of uh, 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 Michael Roman Ferguson and then Eric Garner in, um, in, uh, in New York City. Um, and it's in really the summer of 2020, after the death of George Floyd, uh, that the movement really gained popularity, uh, became even more visible. Uh, in the US and also I think uh, uh, in France. And so we can talk later on about uh, the reasons why um, something shifted uh, in the summer of 2020. There were many reasons. It was not just the death uh, of George Floyd. Obviously it was just, it was a paradigm shift uh, some that happened in, 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 in the summer of 2020. And it turns out that in the summer of 2020, uh, the Comité de Adama in France uh, also gains popularity. And there's a lot of demonstration at the same time that there are many demonstrations uh, in, in the US, uh, in DC, in New York, in Chicago, and in uh, Portland. Um, uh, right after the end of the first lockdown, uh, the Comité Adama actually manages to uh, organize a huge demonstration uh, next to the, the Court Appeal Center in Paris. Uh, to uh, mobilize its members uh, against uh, a decision that was uh, decriminalizing the policemen that were involved in Adama Traoré's uh, death. So, a few. So, I think that really the movement in summer 2020 crystallizes a lot of struggles, uh, both in the U.S. and and and, and in France. Uh, 
few similarities between uh, uh, both movements here. Uh, the call for direct actions. Um, it's something that's very specific to those movements, and I think something in uh, the direction in which uh, the left, both in, in America and the U.S., is moving. Um, in the U.S., uh, demonstrating uh, is not enough anymore uh, for a lot of Black Lives Matter activists. Actions uh, uh, is what's needed. And so we've seen, you know, several things here. Uh, we've seen, uh, for, exam for example, the, the, the throwing down of statues uh, in, uh, in, in the South um, because those statues, you know, again, uh, represented uh, the Confederate South, uh, those were slave owners, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, the fact also, second point, the fact also that this is very much uh, an intersectional uh, uh, movement. Um, it was very uh, obvious to see, it was very evident to see uh, in the US in, in the summer of 2020, um, the fact that the movement really crystallizes uh, a lot of different movements, uh, uh, Occupy, the Bernie Sanders movement, um, uh, the Sunrise movement, to uh, all merge into uh, those Black Lives Matter demonstrations that happened in June. Uh, and in, in, in France, I believe it's, it's, it's also very much uh, the, the same thing. Uh, and it's also, I would say, the use of, uh, their use of new media. Um, uh, the Comité Adama in France does uh, very much uh, communicate with its members and its, and its constituency uh, through social media. And this is exactly what also uh, the movement does uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, if you think about people uh, who started the movement, let's say uh, uh, Doreen McKesson, for example, was very much involved uh, on, on, on Twitter, on social media. It was exactly the same for uh, somebody like Cory Bush, for example, who was just elected uh, recently at, at the House. Um, same thing for Jamal Bowman, same thing in, in, in another respect for AOC. Um, differences now, uh, and, and Pap is going to talk more about this in a minute, but uh, what is precisely this, uh, the fact that those, uh, those two movements have two different histories, uh, and that the French movement is constantly uh, compared to the U.S. movement. Um, and so it's true that those concerns have been invisibilized for a long time uh, in, in, in French uh, due to a lack of, uh, well, race-based data too, um, but also the fact that it's com constantly compared to, uh, to the movement in the U.S., uh, minimizes in in many ways, you know what's happening uh, what's happening in France, uh, and also those are movements that have been uh, 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 that have been criticized for trying to uh, communitarize communitarize uh, a French society. Contrary to uh, what I'm finding in the U.S. Uh, I find that the movement in France is not grounded in institutional politics. Um, in the U.S., again, I mean, there, are, there have been many, uh, many Black Lives members, Black Lives member, Black Lives Matters activists who have been elected to uh, official position. Uh, Corey Bush, I am a Presley Bowman, um, and there's been, for example, uh, a lot of Black Lives Matter uh, activists who uh, were members of DSA and who were also. Uh, elected pretty recently um, in Queens and, and, and in, in Brooklyn. Um, uh, Le Comité Adama, for example, in, 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 uh, in, in France, uh, is very cautious of, uh, of course, the Parti Socialiste, uh, but also of most uh, more um, uh, leftist uh, parties like, uh, like La France Insoumise, for example. Um, and finally, uh, I find that those uh, those uh, those activists um, are not as present in mainstream politics and in ma mainstream media as they are uh, in uh, in the U.S. Um, or at least they're not uh, well they're not found guilty to be right. Uh, 
So uh, in, uh, in 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 the US, I mean, you see, we have seen those activists everywhere in the media. They've been uh, uh, on major mainstream media like MSNBC, for example. Uh, I remember Dory McKesson, you know, having a, a show on 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 BET for a while. Um, so those those people are very present. While, uh, for example, somebody like uh, like Asa Traore, uh, who is very much uh, uh, who seems to be more revered. Uh, in the U.S., who was on the cover of Time magazine, for example, uh, recently, uh, but uh, much less, uh, much less uh, liked or revered uh, by uh, mainstream media uh, in, in in France. And so uh, we can get into much more details, you know, after after uh, Pap's presentation. Uh, but that's that's uh, what I wanted to say as an introduction. Um, Pap, if you would like to take over, yeah. Good evening or good afternoon to you all. It's a real pleasure to uh, speak and, and uh, interact with you. I mean, uh, I'm in Paris. It's a little late, but I'm I'm definitely uh, awake uh, tonight uh, to uh, speak to you. Um, and following up on Tristan's point, um, I want to underline um, um, my main uh, idea, which is that there is a, a long history, a French history of uh, protest uh, against uh, police um, brutalities and a history of police brutalities and, and uh, structural racism uh, within the uh, police uh, in France uh, that needs to be highlighted so as not to see the recent uh, protest uh, that took place in France, especially in uh, June and July following the murder of George Floyd as um, just a spin-off of uh, what uh, happened in uh, the United States. There is a, a local history of uh, protest that uh, needs to be uh, highlighted, which does not mean that this history is insulated and completely disconnected from uh, an international environment, and especially uh, what, uh, what happens in the United States. So my first point would be to uh, insist on the fact that the French police uh, has uh, targeted uh, colonial subjects or targeted colonial subjects or post-colonial subjects, uh, at least uh, since uh, the uh, 1920s when the uh, first uh, specific unit, police unit, was created uh, with the specific purpose to target uh, the colonial subjects that lived in metropolitan France. The purpose was to figure out their political activities, whether they had any connection with revolutionary organizations such as the Communist Party. And this uh, specific police unit reported to the police headquarters in Paris, as well as to uh, the minister of the colonies uh, that is also good for historians, of course, since we have the archives of all the uh, colonial groups uh, and that were created in Paris in uh, the 1920s and 1930s, thanks to those uh, police archives. So there is this emergence uh, in the interwar period of specific police uh, units. But the most important moment is that of the uh, Algerian war um, that uh, really um, uh, started in the mid 1950s. This is really when the uh, police in France, in metropolitan France, started to use methods that were used in the colonial world. Uh, the use of uh, weapons, the use of firearms, uh, the use of uh, lethal violence uh, became uh, common in uh, Paris and in major towns such as Marseille or Lyon by the mid uh, 50s and in the late 50s and early uh, 1960s. Uh, historians have uh, documented how uh, demonstrations taking place in Paris in the late 1950s uh, uh, faced uh, the uh, police brutality in ways which classic demonstrations, for example, the trade unions or even political demonstrations uh, were immune to. Uh, the police 
uh, used um, uh, weapons, uh, killed uh, demonstrators, uh, such as in um, the uh, demonstration in the 13th arrondissement in 1958. And of course, there is uh, this uh, notorious uh, demonstration that took place in the fall of 1961, uh, when uh, um, possibly hundreds of Algerians were killed uh, by the French police and their bodies uh, thrown into the uh, Seine River. Uh, this is one of the most uh, uh, notorious, one of the most uh, tragic moment uh, in the history of French post-World War II uh, France. Uh, and this moment uh, was, has been fairly well documented now. Uh, we don't know exactly how many people were killed, but it's obvious that hundreds of people were killed. Bodies were found all the way to uh, the uh, English uh, Channel um, in the following days. Uh, the head of the police in Paris was uh, Maurice Papon. Uh, Maurice Papon um, started his career um, by collaborating with uh, the Nazis uh, during World War II, and Maurice Papon uh, was uh, responsible for the deportation of hundreds of uh, Jewish persons uh, during the Second World War, and he somehow survived following the war and managed to uh, keep his uh, position all the way to become uh, in the 1970s under President Giscard to become a minister. And this is when newspapers started to publish papers on, on his uh, past, uh, his past of collaborator with the, the Nazis, of course, but also what he did in the early 1960s when he ordered the French police to, um, to kill uh, Algerians. This is something I often tell my students. Um, more people were killed by the police in Paris in the early 1960s than in uh, the United States, than in some parts of the United States, including the, the South, uh, with the civil rights movement. We're talking about hundreds of people being killed uh, at that time by the, um, by the Paris police. Uh, it is also interesting to see that uh, policemen who were stationed in the colonial world were uh, uh, sent back to uh, metropolitan France in the early 60s to use their specific methods, uh, as well as to some colonial uh, or department, overseas departments, such as Martinique and, and Guadeloupe, where there's policemen also behaved in the most uh, brutal way when, for example, crushing the demonstrations that took place in Martinique in 1959. So we can witness the spread of a massive forms of violence by the uh, police targeting uh, the uh, colonial um, slash post-colonial uh, subjects uh, at that time. We should also uh, look at uh, uh, long traditions within the French police uh, of uh, training, targeting non-whites, uh, which uh, still exist today. Uh, race profiling by the French police is uh, an everyday reality of major cities such as uh, Paris, but also the suburbs and elsewhere uh, in France. Uh, there are um, uh, internal histories uh, and, and old policemen who um, proudly tell of their, their uh, time back in the uh, 1970s when they uh, also uh, behaved uh, and told and heard about the stories that took place in the uh, early 1960s and sometimes even, even before. So there is this, this kind of dark uh, memory among the, the police and the, 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 this idea that uh, they have to behave in uh, specific ways uh, and this is what the uh, this is how a policeman a french policeman should should behave this is something also that has affected non-white policemen there are many many testimonies of black and arab policemen who have complained about the way they are being treated by uh, their uh, colleagues in police stations uh, the way they, uh, they, they get nicknames, uh, racist nicknames, um, racist jokes uh, every day. Uh, this is also um, a reality which uh, non-white policemen uh, have to face uh, nowadays in France. 
I also want to insist on uh, another long history, that of protest, as I said, that also started in the uh, 1920s with uh, 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 newspapers, um, um, small newspapers uh, run by uh, colonial uh, activists who denounced the behavior and the uh, tactics of the uh, police, the way they were being treated, uh, the way they were being interrogated, and so on and so forth. Also, of course, uh, in the 1950s, there is a, a protest, uh, there are various forms of, of protest against uh, the uh, police uh, in Paris and, and, and Marseille. There are demonstrations, uh, as I said, sometimes uh, crushed with people being uh, killed, but there are also uh, members of parliament who um, protested, including uh, Aimé Césaire, for example, who protested against uh, the behavior and the, uh, the way police uh, uh, treated um, the uh, colonial uh, subjects. They were not called uh, subjects anymore, but this is what they were in reality. So there is something that uh, is also part of a long tradition, uh, organizations such as uh, the League of Human Rights, which also protested, uh, not so strongly sometimes, but they also protested back in the uh, 1950s and 1960s. Of course, nowadays, we are witnessing a new generation, which was not born uh, following the uh, murder of George Floyd. Uh, there is a, a recent and very um, strong uh, history of uh, protest uh, against uh, race profiling and police uh, and various forms of structural racism um, coming from the police uh, with various groups, uh, including uh, Black Lives Matter. For example, in my own institution, Sciences Po, there is a very uh, active uh, Black Lives Matter um, group, which has more than 50 uh, students. Uh, and this group was organized, I think, at least five or six years ago. So that's something that uh, has uh, been uh, around for quite a bit of time uh, with uh, students uh, organizing various things, uh, uh, not um, sometimes uh, just, you know, just doing little uh, round tables, uh, interviewing people, uh, uh, Facebook pages, uh, the uh, social media being very, very important uh, here. So this has only been um, active, uh, reactivated and, and um, went to another scale uh, in, uh, in June and, and, and July. The main difference, I think, is that this time we've seen a lot of uh, white people, just like in the United States, a lot of white people who have uh, joined these demonstrations. Uh, when uh, Adama Traoré was killed back in July of 2016, the demonstrations that took place in Paris, but also in the suburbs, well, mostly demonstrations by um, uh, black people, Afro descendants, uh, and this time this was quite different. We 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 could we could see a lot of uh, uh, white uh, people, uh, for example, around the uh, justice uh, uh, court uh, in the 17th uh, arrondissement. This massive demonstration that took place, at least 20,000 people, many people, including myself, couldn't even access. Uh, the uh, area where the uh, demonstration uh, took place, in spite of the fact that this demonstration was officially illegal, tens of thousands of people uh, came uh, and it was very obvious that these people were mostly young people, not always, but mostly young people, but a lot of white people. So this is, I would argue, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the striking new dimension of this recent demonstration. It is not that they did not exist before. As I said, there is a long history of it. Uh, it is that they are more uh, multicultural, in some ways multiracial, than they were just back a few years ago when uh, hundreds of people protested, mostly, uh, mostly Black people. Uh, another interesting and original feature, I think, is uh, very much like the US uh, women, a lot of women are very much at the forefront of these uh, demonstrations, these BLM France groups. As I said, the 
Comité uh, Traoré, uh, of course, uh, Comité Adama. Um, uh, so uh, there is a, a very strong uh, um, uh, female dimension with uh, feminist uh, ideas also being uh, mixed and being discussed along with uh, the uh, protest against uh, racial oppression. So that's something that just did not exist uh, 20 years ago, for example. So that's also something quite striking that did not exist to the same extent, for sure, back in the 1950s and 1960s. So to sum it up, I think it's important uh, to um, avoid uh, the um, analysis that would just uh, explain the strength of the uh, French um, protest movement as being uh, an imitation uh, of the American movement. Of course, they are connected. Of course, uh, the murder of George Floyd had an immense impact uh, throughout the world, including in France, but also in countries which we would not, would not suspect. Switzerland, for example, uh, is the country where, which had the largest demonstrations uh, in relation to the uh, population, of course. Uh, so that's very important to look at the connection, to look at the social media, to look at all this. But it is also important to study the local dynamics, the historical dynamics that help explain why uh, the, uh, the take off, why there are so many people, why people um, built the um, analysis mixing uh, George Floyd with uh, Adama Traoré uh, and others. The last point that also struck me was that um, uh, for the first time, I think, there's demonstrations taking place in Paris, but also elsewhere in France, where both in French and English, you could find a lot of signs uh, with uh, Black Lives Matter, of course, but also signs in English. People would also speak in English. There were, there were um, uh, discourses, uh, speeches uh, by various people in English, a mix of English and French. So this is something I've, I had never seen before. So that's, that is also a testimony, of course, of the uh, connection and the, I would argue, the international dimension of the, of the movement. There were many also foreign um, international um, students, for example, participating in the demonstrations in, in, in Paris. So you could hear a lot of languages, uh, people speaking English with various uh, accents, uh, uh, Spanish, uh, whatever. Uh, there are many, many different things. So the uh, cosmopolitan international dimension was, was very strong. And this is something that uh, you wouldn't find, of course, uh, a few uh, decades ago. So Again, uh, new things that need to be stressed, but also a long history, a long French history uh, in many ways uh, that needs to be highlighted uh, so as to avoid the idea that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's all coming from uh, the uh, United States, of course. Very interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ndaye. I, I will ask uh, Tristan, because what you just said now was interesting, that there was such an international, international dimension and there were signs uh, in multiple languages in France, in English, and then you could hear people speak, you know, English. Of course, in the United States, we would definitely hear people speak Spanish, but I, I'm going to ask Tristan, did you did you have that the same uh, dimension? Were you aware of the same dimension? Was it uh, in the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations in the United States? Do you think that, that they had such an in international dimension or not? Because we people who are not U.S. citizens in the in in the U.S. if they if they're arrested demonstrating, they can be banned, you know, from the U.S. So, do, would you would you care to comment on that one, Crystal? Yeah, so that's that's not really what I've seen uh, in in the demonstration in, in in the U.S. Because as you said, uh, it is it is pretty dangerous for somebody who is a foreigner uh, not to uh, to demonstrate in, in in the U.S. However, uh, what I've seen is exactly what Pap has seen in in in, in Paris. Um, it's much more of a of a multiracial, of a multi generational uh, movement. Uh, women were very much involved. Um, uh, it was it was. 
let's not forget also that it was right, and I think this is exactly what happened also in France, it was right after um, uh, COVID, right after the first lockdown. Uh, and so uh, that was right around the time where uh, people did realize uh, that they could die too because of, of their race. Uh, most, most people who died in, the vast majority of people who died in, in, in the United States, um, uh, African-American communities were much more impacted by COVID than, than any others, for example. And so uh, it was just at a moment where all those structural inequalities came to light. Uh, and so what we've seen also in Washington, D.C. Uh, is, uh, is indeed, like Pat said, you know, a lot of white people uh, being very much, uh, very much included and, and, and very much uh, present. Uh, I mean, just right here, uh, around 14th Street, 16th Street, and, and around the mall, um, I remember seeing like older white people uh, uh, being, being in the streets and, and, and giving water or, or just food to, to the demonstrators. And so that type of thing did happen. It was much more, it was a much more broader movement. And it was also, also a much more broader movement, I think, in, uh, in, 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 in politics. Uh, I think in many ways, uh, uh, it synthesized, you know, that the remains of the Bernie Sanders movement, the remains of the Occupy movement, uh, the, the the fight for for climate change too. Uh, it was very uh, there was very little violence, contrary to what has been told in, in the media. You know, it was very uh, telling to see the 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 businesses that were vandalized uh, on, on Connecticut on 16th Street were not your regular pop and mom's businesses. It was the banks. It was the banks that 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 were that that were attacked, you know. Uh, and so I think that's also very telling about uh, how uh, most of those activists conceptualize their political agenda, um, and 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 those are really grounded, you know, in the movements that we've seen recently, you know, going back to ACT UP, to uh, Occupy, to uh, to the Bernie Sanders movement. That this type of uh, uh, inequalities are structural. Uh, that capitalism and racism goes hand in hand, um, and so what the, the discourses that 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 was emerging uh, was very much that you know uh, racial, social, climate, uh, sexual, gender inequalities are all connected, uh, and 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 you cannot just uh, focus on one in order to solve the other. They have to be solved or they have to be uh, tackled at the same time. So would you, both of you, this is a question for both of you, and then I will go to what is in the, in the, the chat because some people have started uh, entering questions in the chat. However, uh, if, if I understood well what you both said, and, and that's why I'm addressing the question to both of you, it seems like the Black Ma Lives Matter activists in the US are having a more of a political life because they are uh, running for elections and they are being elected but it seems that it is not the case in France. Or oh, did I get that wrong? C can you both extrapolate? Maybe Pap, you start and then Tristan take over after? Yeah, I would say that the uh, Black Lives Matter activists in France have a more a marginal position uh, from an institutional standpoint uh, than their American uh, uh, counterparts. Uh, they do not um, they are mostly uh, seen as uh, uh, activists uh, who uh, uh, are uh, sometimes called communitarist, meaning that they uh, would have um, a, 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 a racial focus which is not well considered in uh, the uh, French uh, republicanism uh, as they are being accused of uh, uh, breaking with uh, the uh, French uh, Republic. Uh, so there is a very uh, powerful and negative language which uh, they have uh, to fight. Uh, also, uh, they are not so welcome when it comes to um, running for elections, for example, by uh, classic political organizations. So I would say that uh, uh, even if uh, in spite of the strength of the movement, which we witnessed uh, last uh, spring, June, July, um, uh, they, 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 they remain marginal and they, um, uh, they do not 
not have the same kind of political weight and influence which um, Black Lives Matter has managed to uh, to get in the U.S. There is also in France um, a, a, a tradition of anti-racism, which is a tradition of of defeats, uh, if I may say. The, 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 what the French lack, uh, I would argue, is uh, a history of 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 heroes the way they are uh, celebrated in the United States. The, the French anti-racist movement often sees itself as, uh, uh, as, as in a de very defensive position without the kind of celebrated moments which uh, the US have. There is no French civil rights movement. There is no equivalent to Dr. King or or Malcolm X, to name a few. So there is this also this lack of historical reference, uh, which is also an issue, which is not to say that they do not exist, of course, but they do not enjoy, they do not have the same kind of centrality in collective memories, which uh, the uh, civil rights, uh, movement uh, activists uh, have. So that's also a part of the, uh, that helps explain the relative uh, weakness of the, 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 the when, when comparing, of course, the, the French movement to the, the American movement. So it's, it's also important for historians to highlight, which I briefly uh, alluded to, that is this, this history of protest, uh, this history of uh, protest against uh, colonialism, which uh, is uh, which with uh, with people, with persons, with uh, uh, that that also need to be more well known, that uh, sometimes need to be uh, celebrated. There, there is an issue about street names in France, as the French government seems to be uh, willing to. Uh, uh, um, give uh, street names to a, a number of uh, anti-colonial uh, heroes following a, a report just uh, released uh, on the uh, memory of the Algerian war, for example. So all of this uh, is important so as to uh, create, um, um, uh, to highlight the history and also to create a, a memory where the uh, struggle against colonialism would be uh, celebrated. Tristan, do you want to yeah. add something? Yeah, yeah I, co I completely agree with what Pap said. Um, uh, in, in the US, it's true that those Black Lives Matter activists have been much more integrated into institutional politics. And they're following also that here again, a long tradition, I would say that dates back to um, uh, Jesse Jackson in the late uh, 70s. There's this concept of like the Rainbow Coalition. You know, in, in, in the late 1970s, uh, Jesse Jackson decides that it's it, it's time to have black mayors, you know, in America. And in order to get black mayors elected, they need to they are building uh, rainbow coalitions, integrating you know, feminist movements, uh, working class movements, uh, union movements, uh, um, LGBT movements. You know, never forget that in America, for example, uh, the, the the first people who ask for uh, marriage equality uh, are African American mayors in 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 the early 80s. Um, so uh, uh, absolutely, and so and there are uh, a lot of Black Lives Matter uh, uh, matters activists who have become, you know, official uh, po politicians. Uh, the first one that comes to mind, of course, just at the beginning because he was such a visible, uh, a visible uh, figure, uh, was Dore Mackison, you know, who ran for uh, to be mayor of of, uh, of Baltimore, um, and then of course. Uh, uh, the string of uh, uh, justice Democrats uh, that were just uh, just elected um, in, in in the past election uh, was also telling Cory Bush, you know, Presley, Jamal Bowman, who are joining uh, uh, AOC and the Squad. Uh, I mean, all of those, you know, are have 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 had an impact. I have also to say that uh, 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 the Democratic Socialist Party have seen an increase in its member uh, in, in, in the past year, following the summer uh, of uh, 2020 uh, uh, riots. And it's also important to mention, you know, that the Black Lives Matter activists and uh, 
uh, in conjunction with Sunrise, the Sunrise Movement, had um, uh, a very central impact on what happened in Georgia. Um, a lot of people were sent from New York to Georgia to organize for the election uh, of uh, uh, Osop and, and the Reverend Warnock. And so here, there too, uh, racial politics were at play. You know, I mean, uh, Warnock was darkened on the commercials. Osop uh, had this nose uh, 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 launched uh, in, in the commercials too. Uh, so uh, the Black Lives Matter activists that were involved there uh, also helped creating uh, uh, this movement and, 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 and eventually getting those two senators uh, elected. We have a very interesting question from Cathy Fuchs, and I will take the questions by uh, um, uh, by order, and then Natasha will take the, the second one. But Cathy has a double question. She said she asked, "How have you seen these movements affecting the U.S. and France's soft power influence and diplomatic legitimacy?" Um, oops. Um, yeah, uh, in other countries, especially on the African continent. In other words, are there are these historical structural racial inequality issues impacting American and or French international standing and influence abroad? Yeah, that's a very good question. That uh, reminds me of a long conversation I had with uh, Emmanuel Macron last week. And uh, I was telling him that um, when uh, uh, Michel uh, uh, Zeclair, the this uh, black man was uh, severely beaten uh, by the French police. You may have heard of that. He was uh, uh, he was just getting in his place, and the police uh, stormed in his uh, studio, and he was beaten, and it and he was very much uh, injured, and that created a, a scandal in France, and a massive demonstration was organized to protest against uh, police brutality. So this was back in November. And this uh, triggered uh, a lot of interest, uh, many uh, papers in American newspapers, but also in Africa and elsewhere. I got uh, 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 WhatsApp uh, messages from my cousins in West Africa uh, wondering about what was going on in, in, in Paris. So. I, I, I told uh, the president that uh, this had a, a clear effect on, uh, on, uh, on France and, 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 and the way France uh, pretends to be uh, at the forefront of uh, human rights. It is uh, impossible to uh, be uh, this uh, country where human rights uh, were born, supposedly. Uh, that where uh, human rights are proclaimed to be uh, a number one priority and in the same time have these uh, horrible images of policemen um, brutalizing uh, a black man uh, in, in, in Paris. This is not something that uh, is, um, is, uh, is, is, is a positive thing and, uh, and, and, and clearly uh, the, the, the world or part of the world was also looking at uh, the way uh, the uh, French government reacted following uh, this, uh, this uh, what happened in, in, in Paris. So uh, it, 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 it's interesting that the president for the first time spoke of uh, a form of institutional racism uh, or structural racism when in fact uh, the uh, police uh, trade unions uh, always deny that there is any form of structural racism within the police. So there are things that start to move very slowly, but speaking of structural racism now in France is not as, uh, uh, as impossible almost as it, as it used to be. It, 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 it's getting slowly getting into the uh, conversation, into the standard uh, democratic conversation in France, which was not the case uh, a year ago when you would speak of that. So there are things uh, taking place. And I strongly believe that the, um, uh, the image of France, the, uh, uh, the echoes from uh, um, all around the world, including from the United States, uh, 
um, play a role in the way the uh, government reacted uh, following the beating of uh, this uh, black man in Paris. Dion question, the Dion question is, can you speak about France's colorblind approach to race relations? In fact, uh, how, how some, some, one of you mentioned there was no race data in France, which dates back to what happened in World War II because of the, the rounding up of the Jews when the Jews had to sign up uh, you know, uh, at the police station during World War II. And after that, that's when France decided not to have any raised data, but how can you speak about that? Because the French tend to forget that historical aspect and they just say they call a blind uh, pr approach to race relations impacts the French Black Lives Matter movement. It's, it, it is clear that uh, uh, we do not have the, the, the same kind of uh, statistics at, at, as uh, the one that exists in the United States or in uh, some European countries such as uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, and there is this kind of official colorblind policy, which is a huge uh, problem indeed when it comes to highlighting uh, the very existence of uh, racial uh, disparities and racial discriminations. However, um, it is not true to say that there are no rac uh, racial statistics in France. There are some statistics. It is possible to build such statistics. It is not easy there it's not as common as in the united states for sure but there are some statistics uh, for example the csr which is this official authority in charge of uh, um, looking at the french tv every year publishes uh, statistics related to the french tv non-whites uh, blacks uh, asians people of asian descent arab descent etc about uh, the uh, um, fiction and non-fiction programs of the French uh, TV. So that's one example among uh, uh, a few others that uh, show that uh, we're not in a world where there's uh, statistics do not exist, but we need more statistics. Uh, there are some statistics related to the behavior of the police. Uh, a, a black man has up to uh, 20 times is more likely to be uh, race profiled or to be interrogated by the police uh, than a, a white person. So it's uh, that we have some data about all this, but uh, we still have a, 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 a lot to 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 a lot of road to uh, to cover. Um, but clearly, uh, things are are moving a little not for, not fast for sure, but they are. They are moving. It's it's it's. There is a growing awareness that the standard colorblind discourse um, has failed to uh, address uh, issues of racial discrimination. But I'm not saying it's a it's a majority of people. But it's it's a growing awareness. That's how I would put it. And this awareness did not exist uh, 20 years ago when I came back from the United States, back to France, when I uh, settled in Paris. Uh, uh, it was almost impossible to speak of racial statistics in France. Now it is possible. Uh, so that's, that's a little, uh, that makes me a little optimistic. Yeah, and if I can add something on, on, on the uh, American side here is that it seems that we're going uh, one step further here now um, because those uh, those identities actually do not really mean anything to this younger this the younger generation. What I've seen in, in, in many of my of my classes is that more and more uh, uh, more and more students you know are, are, are trying to create uh, their own language, their own identities, their own uh, uh, racial identity. So um, uh, a lot of time, you know, the 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 box other, the box mix is is being ticked. And same thing for gender, same same thing for uh, sexual orientation. Uh, it seems that uh, uh, the new generation, I mean, uh, especially millennials, uh, are creating new language, new discourses, uh, and new ways uh, to look uh, to look uh, to look at those uh, identity politics. Uh, and so here we have another. Great question uh, by Kathy, and I'll let um, Dr. Capello answer that first. Um, so what conflict consequences, if any, do you predict the American and French governments will face if they do not create real change or implement effective action 
what are potential consequences for American and French society if these issues are not meaningfully addressed? Yeah, so I mean, let's speak about, uh, uh, let's talk about the new president, for example. Um, the way they are targeting, the way they are trying to address uh, racial issues uh, with, with uh, the new administration uh, is by having all this diversity uh, uh, in, in, in the government. Uh, which is a wonderful thing because representation matters because it opens up, you know, a field of possibilities for a younger generation too. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, some scholars of diversity have argued that uh, first don't always, first do not always matter, do not always impact um, uh, society at, at, at a ground level. Uh, and that's what we've seen, you know, for example, with... Uh, with the presidency of Barack Obama, you know, we always have to uh, remember and to remind people that the Black Lives Matter movement was born um, uh, during the presidency uh, of, of, of Barack Obama. Uh, that, uh, you know, Barack Obama deported much, many more people, for example, than, than, than George W. Bush. Um, so uh, uh, my point here being that uh, often uh, when we try to fight uh, systemic racism, uh, it's those examples that are giving back to us. Well, I mean, why are you saying that the U.S. is, is systemat systematically racist? Because we have elected uh, um, uh, a black president, we have elected a black vi vice president, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so most of the time, those things that are meant to be uh, helpful and progressive um, uh, are usually coming back to us. Uh, when we are trying to uh, to to make real change, uh, Monsieur Ndaya, uh, do you want to add anything in terms of uh, France and the situation in France about that? About the the question on on the consequences, right? Yeah. Exactly, if the um, real change is not taken. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, as a historian, I tend to look uh, back rather than forward. It's uh, somehow easier. Uh, so um, uh, I, I, I do not make predictions. I look at the uh, current uh, situation, uh, which is not only that of, uh, uh, of, uh, of an anti-racist movement that uh, is uh, definitely stronger now than it was a, a year ago, but it is also uh, a moment when the uh, extreme right is, is is very strong and very influential on the on French politics, so that's also something to take into account uh, when looking at the French uh, situation. The um, the fact that uh, well you you had Trump um, up until yesterday we have uh, the extreme right, uh, which is not in power, but very strong, very influential uh, on these uh, issues. Um, and uh, I, you know, I would argue that the uh, uh, extreme right is definitely more organized and uh, stronger uh, these days uh, than the anti-racist movement. Uh, the anti-racist movement uh, faces a lot of difficulties, including um, divisions uh, between the so-called universalist, the old style uh, colorblind uh, tradition, which we uh, uh, alluded to, and uh, a new generation of activists who uh, um, uh, sweep on the side the uh, old uh, colorblind republicanism uh, to highlight uh, the um, existence of racial discrimination. They do not hesitate to speak of race, uh, which is uh, something uh, very unusual in France, uh, speaking of using the, 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 uh, the uh, 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 language uh, uh, with, with, with race and, and, and racial issues. That's highly uncommon. And a lot of people um, who would... Uh, proclaim to be anti-racist uh, are extremely reluctant uh, to uh, speak of racial issues because races are supposed not, not in existence. They do not exist. So they, they, they stick to this uh, uh, classic uh, 
uh, colorblind uh, perspective. So that's one uh, very strong issue, that of the divisions. Plus, as I said, the extreme right. So the situation is not, is not perfect, uh, to say the least. And uh, the upcoming uh, presidential election uh, may very well see, uh, a, a, again, uh, the National Front, um, the extreme right organization, being at the forefront, not winning, but being at the forefront and uh, influencing uh, even more uh, French politics. So we are in a very, very tough uh, situation with a stronger anti-racist movement facing, uh, I would say, an even stronger uh, nationalist, xenophobic, uh, racist movement. Uh, very, uh, very unhappy of uh, Trump's defeat, uh, for sure, but uh, that remains very strong in this country. We have a couple of more interesting questions, most of them um, directed at the situation in France, as I guess um, there's more need to know more about that. Let me just find it. Um, um, so it was a question from uh, Jacqueline Rose, uh, who is uh, commenting and asking, the first I heard of obvious racial problems in the movement in France were the push pas mon pot and sauce racism activities, act activities, yes. Has either of those uh, lingered and had effects on the present movements? I'm not sure because uh, SOS racism was uh, strong back in the 1980s, but has been widely uh, criticized and uh, especially in uh, the uh, popular neighborhoods uh, where non-whites uh, tend to live. SOS racism is not very popular among those people. It's often seen as a very uh, static uh, uh, institutional organization which uh, doesn't look seriously at, the, uh, at, at, at what people uh, face in their everyday lives. So uh, that is why uh, we have witnessed the emergence of uh, uh, smaller, more agile organization, grassroots organizations such as the Comité Adama. And those organizations uh, distance themselves from the old style uh, universalistic organizations such as uh, SOS uh, Racism. So there is something um, going on uh, in the anti-racist uh, movement uh, which uh, has uh, somehow left behind uh, the League of Human Rights or uh, SOS Racism in many ways. And if I can just add something on SOS Racism, and a lot of historians have actually uh, uh, trying to show also that the movement was created by, by the Socialist Party or was actually built by the Socialist Party at the time in order to put the emphasis in the media on racial politics and also as a result to make sure that uh, the extreme right would rise and therefore, you know, would, would, would also help uh, uh, more institutional, you know, right party, uh, conservative party to, to fail and, and therefore help the, the Socialist Party to remain in power. So there's a lot of history here right there that we don't really truly know uh, about about SOS fascism, but it was a it, it, it was an intriguing movement. If I if I may jump on this uh, question by uh, Gretchen on uh, cultural institutions, I'd be more than happy to um, to say a few words on that because I've just uh, finished a, a big study a report on the on discriminations and diversity at the Opéra de Paris. And the question is, in the US, many museums and other cultural institutions issued statements in support of BLM and against racism after the murder of George Floyd. Have uh, French museums made similar statements? Um, uh, so the, it, the, that, that really, that's really interesting because many artists, uh, including uh, dancers and musicians at the Opéra de Paris, uh, protested uh, the uh, uh, the silence of their uh, institutions uh, during the demonstrations last uh, June, and uh, they asked the opera or the museums to say something about what was going on. Uh, and they at the Opéra de Paris, uh, a group of uh, non-white dancers wrote a manifesto to ask for significant changes at the opera, uh, 
the recruitment of non-white dancers more than a few uh, non-white musicians, the end of uh, various forms of microaggressions, uh, and also uh, significant changes uh, in the opera and ballet uh, that often uh, feature uh, racist or semi-racist um, stories and, and characters. Uh, so this uh, triggered uh, a very interesting uh, movement and uh, I was in charge of, uh, of writing a, a, a report which will be released next week. Uh, but there's been quite a bit of talk about all this already in French newspapers uh, uh, to figure out how uh, uh, an institution such as the Opéra can answer uh, the demands uh, from Black Lives Matter uh, within its own ranks. Uh, and I believe that uh, such uh, central institutions as uh, the Louvre and Orsay have also been facing um, similar issues, may maybe not to the same extent, but are also facing uh, issues related to the, the, the world of curators, for example, which is all white, uh, and the world of uh, janitors, which is all black. Uh, in these uh, prestigious institutions. So this is also as if what was seen as normal in France, you know, a curator is white, uh, a, a security person at the museum is black, and that's, that's how it is. This was seen as normal for the longest time. And now there is this growing awareness, this growing feeling that something is wrong that this is not what it should be. This is not that it's not because uh, it is because there, there are issues related to justice, to racial justice, racial justice in France. This awareness that things need to change somehow. So of course people, you know, the heads of museum want change at a slow pace. They are not, they are not revolutionaries for sure. But I think that a window has opened uh, for a few months. And I believe that uh, that's another positive effect of the massive mobilization that uh, followed the uh, murder of George Floyd. I have a great comment and a question from Jennifer Fulton, who says, first of all, thank you for a great discussion. And uh, so she's inquiring into what French language books and authors do you recommend for further insights into both countries' movements. So I can start with that one. Uh, uh, in, in French, uh, Assa Traoré has written actually a book with uh, the philosopher uh, Geoffroy de la Ganerie, and it's called The Combat Adama, and I think it summarizes beautifully um, uh, the issues that concern the history uh, in, a, in, a, in a very radical way, uh, but, but excellent. Um, and, and, and I think it, it, it's, it's very approachable, it's very readable for, for a non-native speaker too. Uh, Monsieur Ndaye, do you have any recommendations in terms of books published in France on this topic? Um, Jennifer Fulton was asking uh, about any literature to read further on um, on, this, on this topic. Yeah, um, Tristan mentioned a book, which is a great book, of course. Um, there's, um, when it comes to BLM, and it's, uh, it's, it's not as if there was a ton of books uh, that uh, have come out uh, since uh, last uh, spring. Uh, for example, um, um, I would recommend um, articles that have been published uh, since uh, last uh, spring. Um, the best bet, I suppose, would be to uh, send a, a small bibliography uh, to the Alliance Francaise, if it's possible, so that you can all uh, uh, find what uh, is available and it's going to take less time than mentioning all these all this references. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we can prepare that uh, together with uh, you and I can send it as a follow up to all the attendees, even to those who probably couldn't attend. Um, Nelson is asking in which regions in France is the anti-racism movement is strong? 
I don't know if you can mention a particular region with a different. That's a good question. I'm not sure about that. I would basically say the uh, uh, the, the the metropolitan areas, uh, the large metropolitan areas, are clearly the places where you would find the largest movements uh, because of demography for sure, but also because of the uh, more multiracial population, more diverse uh, population. Paris is an obvious case, of course, but you find Lille and, and, and Marseille and, and Lyon and, 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 and Bordeaux, also cities with a large student population. Uh, we don't have college towns the way they exist in the US, but there are cities with a, a huge college population, college student, uh, undergrad student population, such as Rennes, for example, in, in Brittany. Um, and in fine, if you, if you look at Rennes in, in Brittany, uh, there were huge demonstrations in June and in July, and there's a, a, a long tradition of, uh, of protest and, uh, and leftist groups in a city such as Rennes. Uh, so that's one example among others. And this, is, it, this echoes, of course, what also uh, took place in the United States, the, the demonstrations that took place in larger cities, but also in smaller towns, um, including uh, college towns where uh, the uh, students mobilized uh, in, uh, in ways which uh, uh, the U.S. hadn't uh, experienced uh, since uh, the 1960s and the uh, uh, anti-Vietnam War protest in many ways. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll take the last question because it's getting late, especially in France. So Sabine is asking uh, which French party could be considered an ally of the anti-racist movements? It's it's hard to it's hard to, to 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 say. The obvious answer would be uh, parties on the left. Uh, the 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 Greens, the Green Party, would be uh, fairly in connection with uh, the youth and a number of issues which have surfaced uh, these uh, past few years, as Tristan mentioned, uh, the environmental issues, uh, climate change, of course, the Me Too movement and anti-racism are the three, uh, the, the, this kind of political triangle uh, that um, uh, where the, uh, the youth uh, is, is, um, is organized and, 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 and politicized. So I would say that the, the Green Party would be the party uh, which is in more in connection than others. Um, yeah, that's- Yeah, and if, if I can just add something to this, uh, uh, um, a lot of the people that Asa Traoré, which doesn't represent the whole Black Lives Matter movement, of course, uh, Geoffroy Laganry, uh, uh, Didier Rigon, uh, Edouard Louis, are all closely connected to, uh, to uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon's party, La France Insoumise. Um, and uh, and so that's also one 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 of their allies there. Sure. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, joining us for this very insightful conversation, Dr. Tristan Cabello from John Hopkins University and Dr. Pablo Derrière from Sciences Po, connecting from France, which is very late there right now. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your great questions. And uh, as a reminder, this has been recorded and will be on Alliance Française YouTube channel. Thank you very much again. Have a nice end of your week and see you soon. A bientôt. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye.